very happy to say I've managed to coax my friend of Julian Pellet, friend, we've been friends for 45 years, I think, Jules. Yeah. Long time. Um, <laughs> I, and I, I've just got to say, I, between you and Duncan Clark, I feel like I'm surrounding myself with my intellectual superiors the whole, the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> but out of my depth. But um, I really mean it when I say I think... Uh, well, I don't think I know you're a master of the English language, and uh, I, I, I think your knowledge of African history is um, almost in a class of its own. I know you deny that, but um, I know I've learned a lot from you, and I think people could learn a lot from listening to you, particularly the younger generation that I believe have been led to believe a lot um, about our history that is that is incorrect, and um, I just I just know that uh, what you're going to tell us is based on fact, and it's what um, a lot of people need to know uh, when trying to understand where we are today in Africa. But enough from me, Jules. Uh, thanks very much for your time today. Alice, thank you for that kind and inflated. <laughs> uh, I, I I feel that I'm sitting next to my. Uh, uh, as it were, in in in, uh, in the internet space, next to my intellectual uh, superior, uh, you know, a published author uh, and uh, a publisher extraordinaire. So uh, allow me to replay the compliment. <laughs> Thanks, Jules. Um, I want to get straight into this whole. I want to tackle the whole the whole story about colonialism, really, and it, sure. and it and it and it really goes back to. Um, the Catholics and 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 religion, in a sense, um, am I am I right in saying that? Yeah, I mean, there's some interesting perspectives I think um, relating to the whole, uh, essentially, the Christian Christian dimension. I mean, I should just preface um, anything I have to say by by making it clear that I'm I'm not a professional historian, and that you know, any views that I express are entirely personal mm -hmm. um, and not researched. Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, in, in in depth or anything like that. So it's a sort of spontaneous discussion, if you like. That's yes, that's the, the, yeah. the limit of the intellectual depth to it all. And I'm quite uh, quite sure there'll be folks out there who, who who might challenge me, and that's fine. Um, yeah, I think the 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 whole relationship between colonialism, uh, specifically European colonialism, obviously, um, and religion is a is a fascinating area. If we just think about the, the, the church, the Christian church, from its earliest foundation uh, until the time of the Reformation uh, with uh, Martin Luther King, uh, essentially in Western Europe we're talking about, I'm not, I'm not referring here to the, the Greek or Russian Orthodox churches, but the, the church of Western Europe uh, was singular in as much as it was the Roman Catholic church. And the, the whole essence of Roman Catholicism prior to the Reformation was um, obedience to church doctrine. Uh, the notion that the church was there to serve individuals simply wasn't uh, a factor in, in that church uh, doctrine and, and, and policy. And the Christian flocks uh, were expected to uh, demonstrate uh, obedience to the mother church, whose uh, priests and clergy were, were there to uh, ensure uh, obedience. Uh, and it was also during this, uh, these formative centuries of the Roman Catholic Church that the, the, whole, the whole notion of monogamy, you know, being married to one person and one person only, and the concomitant uh, development, invention, if you like, uh, by the Catholic Church of the nuclear family, is an incredibly important facet of history that we can subsequently trace uh, into some of the drivers uh, of colonialism. And I'll link that up in due course, but these are, these are important factors. Right. So the early Christian um, missionaries uh, of the Christian church uh, were essentially Ro Roman Catholics. Uh, uh, and if we're looking specifically at the African context rather than the Far East and so, and so forth, um, and these, these were Roman Catholic missionaries uh, initially who, who were prompted by the discoveries of Portuguese uh, explorers like Vasco, uh, Vasco de Gama and, and Bartholomew Dias and so on. 
um, opening up routes to the, the East Indies spice trade uh, and so forth. Um, and in the in the wake, literally in the wake of the uh, explorer ships that uh, uh, touched on the African continent at key places to get fresh water and, and reprovision, of course, there were there were the first contacts with the um, Africa south of the Sahara, other than the Barbary coast, which is a slightly different um, kettle fish. But uh, and it, it's it's therefore uh, no surprise that the early missionaries into Africa were Roman Catholic missionaries initially. Um, Portuguese in origin. And of course, if we're looking at Zimbabwe, of course, that is our common ground, our common heritage, like you and I. Uh, you know, some of the earliest missionary um, uh, relics, uh, the archaeology of uh, early churches are all from Roman Catholic, uh, uh, Roman Catholic clergy of uh, Portuguese origin. I remember as a kid going out to a, uh, an archaeological excavation uh, out near Alice Mine, uh, in the Iron Duke um, range near Mazoe Dam and, and, and seeing the foundations of one of those early uh, Jesuit uh, mission churches being uh, revealed. So the Kingdom of Monomotapa, Mozambique, so on. These, these were the early treading grounds of the Roman Catholic missionaries. And their, their purpose in developing those sort of missionary links were, I think, twofold. Firstly, to uh, open up uh, potential trade prospects uh, but also to save souls i mean this is what the uh, this is what drove the the roman catholic church was the, the need to ensure that as many souls as possible were saved from purgatory in the first place and ultimately from 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 hell um and as i say the the, the nuclear family became the bedrock of the uh, roman catholic christian uh, tradition and uh, that sort of I hate the word now because it is so used in a, a malignant sense, but the, the sort of the notion of the, the family patriarch uh, at the head of the, the nuclear family and so on became a bedrock of, of commercial activity. Um, so there, there we have it. And then probably the, the most significant earthquake in political and social history that um, affected all of our lives uh, was the um, actions of Martin Luther uh, in, I can't remember, 1517, I think it was, um, when he nailed his 95 theses to the door of Wittenberg Church, uh, in which he castigated and criticised the Roman Catholic Church yeah, as it had become uh, for its corrupt practices in selling indulgences to people to buy their way out of purgatory and hell and so on and so forth. But why that is significant and why I'm linking that, if you like, ultimately to colonialism is that it was Luther's actions, which obviously set off what we call now the Reformation, but more particularly, uh, which initiated the rise of the Protestant element of uh, the Christian church. And that's very, very important because as a consequence of that, you saw different sects of Protestant Christianity evolving and developing. For example, the Quakers. And the Quakers uh, became, uh, along with people like the Methodists and so on, uh, captains of industry. Let's, let's confine our discussion to, to Britain, uh, as it were. But the Quakers and the Methodists and other nonconformists of Britain were the people who really spearheaded the whole of the British colonial experiment. Um, initially, uh, under Queen Elizabeth I and uh, Walter Raleigh, discovering uh, you know, North America and opening up the, uh, the settlements uh, in Virginia at Roanoke uh, and so forth. And uh, what I'm trying to say is that there was the, these Protestant uh, denominations that were the drivers of commerce in Britain and who subsequently drove uh, the whole colonial experiment, for primarily for commercial development and gain. The other important thing about the Protestant uh, Christianity, as distinct from Roman Catholicism, is it very, very much emphasized and focused on uh, Christian belief as being something internal to the individual, uh, as distinct from a, if you like, a herd uh, belief reflected back in obedience to the church. Mm -hmm. And so the, the cult of the individual became prominent in Christian theology uh, in these Protestant denominations. And why is that important? Again, linking it, if you like, to the colonial aspect, uh, the, the, the notion of 
blessed be the poor in spirit, for they shall inherit the earth. The, these kind of things became very, very much more important. There'd always been a tradition in the Christian church, initially through the Roman Catholic Church, uh, of uh, helping the poor and the, uh, the oppressed. But in the Roman Catholic Church, this is more about saving one own, one's own soul. Uh, you know, doing good deeds in order to earn credit uh, from God Almighty so that you had a less chance of entering purgatory or even worse, still hell. Whereas in the Protestant tradition, the whole belief system was internalized into the individual mm -hmm. uh, and with a focus on, um, if you like, uh, acts of charity and support for the poor and the underdog as being principal uh, ideals that drove that face along with that kind of commercial approach. Jules, it's fair to say there was a, uh, a commercial component that um, a lot of what motivated these people was a well-intentioned desire to uplift people. Yes, I think that, I think that, is, that is so. And, and you know, the, the eventual um, development, for example, of very powerful organizations like the London Missionary Society did have as their goal uh, the idea of converting uh, people and uh, uh, you know peoples of the uh, if you like the the, the exotic world um, out there and uh, 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 and saving their souls. Yes, I mean that that is that was a primary driver for for the uh, the the fervor of of the sort of religious leadership. But there is no doubt about it that the development of of colonialism was also strongly driven. Uh, by commercial needs. And I mean, this is, this is quite an interesting area because if you think about it, the expeditions that Walter Raleigh carried out where he, he initially settled the, uh, the, the North American continent were primarily um, commercial expeditions. They floated the company and, and people bought shares in that and uh, hoped to, to gain riches. And if you think about it, that's not altogether different in character and orientation of purpose from the British South Africa Company. Uh, that was set up under the auspices of the British government by Cecil John Rhodes uh, in order to uh, exploit the resources and the opportunities presented uh, by the country, which eventually became known as Rhodesia, which wasn't incidentally Rhodes's word for it. it was, he, he recorded Sambesia, which is quite a nice name, really. But that's an aside. But uh, saying, uh, I think uh, these, these commercial... Ahead, Jules, I just Sorry. want to go back um, to that period um, and the philosophers and the writers, Rousseau, um, his influence, um, and then Dickens, um, in his writings, he has an indirect influence on, on what's to come. Yeah, I think the, um, I mean, Rousseau is, is, is just one example, and quite a, a, perhaps the best known of, of many such, but uh, following the Reformation, that, that, that evolved into what we now know as the Enlightenment of the 18th century. And uh, it was during this period that uh, increasing contact with foreign peoples uh, through the process of colonialism um, in North America and then gradually uh, more in Africa um, uh, grew. And it was during this time that people like Jean-Jacques Rousseau, uh, the romantic uh, philosophers of the Enlightenment, developed this notion of the noble savage. Uh, the dignity of, uh, if you like, uncivilized, and I don't mean that in a, in a derogatory sense, but uncivilized uh, people um, from completely different and undeveloped cult cultures. And Rousseau and others developed this notion that these were untainted, these peoples were untainted by, uh, if you like, the, the, the negative side of, of civilization, that they were, they, they lived in a certain degree of innocence. Of course, this, this was a highly romantic notion which uh, in reality simply didn't exist i mean the life that these people led uh, uh, was 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 far from being noble um, and far from being pleasant uh, but this was the if you like the western european liberal view emerging uh, of the noble savage or rather if you like condescending concepts you know we're, we're civilized we're great but you know we we like you because we think you're you're noble and innocent but this, this, this sort of idea um, really signals the commencement of um, the pre preoccupation with the noble savage, which is still very powerful in liberal Western politics today. And in this, in this woke world, which has gone mad around us, uh, you know, with the 
you know, the contemporary movements and so on, focusing in on these exotic peoples, as it were, is nothing more than a, an evolution and an extension of that idea. Uh, we see, you mentioned Charles Dickens uh, in his novel Bleak House. Uh, there, is a, it, it, there is a fantastic um, portrayal of the character of Mrs. Um, Jellaby. Mrs. Jellaby uh, is a rather wealthy uh, London socialite um, who neglects her own children because she spends all her time um, <laughs> raising money in her plush mm. London, London salon uh, to raise money for the natives of Bori Bolar. Uh, and, um, you know, this is, this is Jean-Jacques Rousseau speaking to us through Dickens long after his death. Uh, this preoccupation with, if you like, as I say, the, the concept of the noble savage is nothing new. And we see that evolving and developing into its modern kind of uh, presentation in our, in our woke world of today. Yeah, very true, uh, Jules. Um, let's have a look at the Bible, um, the influence. How did, how did Christian teachings um, morph into um, a motivation for Marxist thought? Um, yeah, uh, gosh, uh, I, I, I can only um, cough out a few kind of simplistic ideas, ideas on this. But um, if I can just slight, take a slight dog leg to come back to, to that. I think, I, you know, I, I said that Martin Luther's um, contribution to our world history was, was an earthquake. Well, the second one was Karl Marx, who was the most unsavory character. If you ever read the detailed biography of the man, he, he suffered from boils, he smelt, he never, he never did a job of work in his life, as it were, and relied on other people to fund him, and was fairly unpleasant towards his wife. Wasn't a nice guy. But, but Marx, as we all know, Marx, Marx's idea uh, is dialectic, has, has been an explosion a political explosion from which we are still suffering, not just aftershocks, but ongoing earthquakes. And Marx came up with this notion, and this is uh, very much part of the dynamic of what's going on today, this idea of the, the oppressed versus the oppressors, and that the only way that you can deal with that dynamic is, to, is completely to overthrow the oppressor and, and, to, and to institute complete change. And, and in order to do that, you have to destroy the oppressor. There is no such thing as uh, changing the oppressor or reducing its power. The oppressor has to be obliterated from the face of the earth. Men, women, children, dogs, cats, you name it, they've got to go. That's the basic idea behind Marxism. So the, this dynamic of the oppressed versus the oppressors uh, has, has had a huge uh, uh, impact on political and religious thinking. As far as the, the uh, influence on, on Christian theology, well, I mean, you see it at its most extreme in the sort of liberation theology movements in, in South America uh, and, and the, 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 the uh, development by senior clergy uh, of, of very Marxist uh, Christian perspectives at a more simplistic level and a more generalized level. Uh, I mean, Christianity since Luther has been, as I said, preoccupied uh, with the poor, with the underdog, uh, with the oppressed, if you like, yeah. and and so in in many ways, uh, 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 the more gentle uh, or the gentler interpretations of, of Marx's uh, dynamic have filtered through into uh, Christian um, theory and, and influenced the development of of, of Christian thinking. Uh, particularly through the 20th century after the Russian Revolution, when communism became a kind of fashionable thing amongst the chattering classes and remains so to this day. I mean, for example, uh, we hear constantly of Hitler uh, being held up as the bogeyman, which he was quite, quite, quite evidently. But I mean, in terms of sheer numbers of people killed and so on, Stalin was far, far worse by a huge margin. I mean, it is estimated that Stalin was responsible for something like over 25 million deaths, which is more than were killed in the entire sphere of World War II, including the Holocaust. But because uh, he represented, if you like, left-wing progressive thinking, uh, he is still today not condemned in the same sorts of vigorous terms as is Hitler. Interesting. Jules, am I right? Um, Marx could actually refer back to the to the Bible, uh, to Matthew, uh, re referring to the fact that blessed are the poor, 
And this is where there's a, a Christian pivot uh, in, in the direction of Marxism. Well, uh, yes, I mean, I'd, I'd maybe put it slightly the other way around, that, that, that you know, that Marxist thinking on the, the dynamics of, of the oppressed versus the oppressors, uh, the, 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 you know, the, the, the need to create revolution uh, to address the problems of the victims, if you like, uh, that, is, that is a strong line of thinking which is filtered into Christian theology and which has influenced the development of, of, of Christian thinking and then Western politics generally over the course of the 20th century. And we now see in the first fifth of the, the, uh, the 21st century, uh, you know, some fairly extreme iterations of, of, of that thought process. And it's fair to say it was really Luther in a way that initiated the process that brought democracy uh, to, to, to Britain, to, to England. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think that's, I wouldn't um, lay the, um, give credit for democracy entirely to Luther. I, I mean, Britain, I mean, Britain's an interesting country in terms of its history because there was, you know, ever since Magna Carta, um, back in the 12th century, I can't remember exactly where it, when it was now, but Magna Carta really um, was the first toll of the democratic bell. Uh, it certainly didn't apply to every single person in the land. It was primarily Magna Carta. It was all about the knights of the realm saying, you know, that they wanted a little bit more control and that the king shouldn't, you know, should give up a bit. That's what that was all about, um, primarily. But nevertheless, it was a first, um, as I say, first toll of the democratic bell in, 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 in the Western world. And Britain's um, history, apart from its um, one civil war, uh, has reflected a, a much more stable kind of political environment yeah. than the rest of Western Europe, where, you know, until relatively recently, uh, you know, it was run by uh, kings and despots uh, without a democratic kind of baseline. What Luther did, I think, was through the development of the, the Protestant religion was to uh, you know, inadvertently, clearly, but but the consequence of that was a much greater emphasis on the individual, uh, and, and that gradually filtered into the the notion of uh, universal suffrage uh, uh, during the nineteenth and early twentieth century. And on, on that particular point, one thing that's interesting is that I mean, we hear constantly about the uh, you know the fight of the women, another oppressed uh, uh, group, if you like. Uh, as it being portrayed to the, the feminists to achieve the vote, and that was a wonderful story. I mean, you know, to think that women were denied the vote for so long is, you know, is is a is something that we we sorted out in Western democracy, and that's a good thing. But uh, what what's interesting is that at the same time as women got didn't have the vote, uh, uh, the huge percentage of the population in this country also didn't have the vote. There were many men out there who were not allowed to vote. And uh, when universal suffrage came in and women were admitted to the uh, voting electorate, so a huge swathe of men also uh, were admitted uh, into universal suffrage. So that's a little fact that isn't widely broadcast. Yeah. So I think the, the, the Reformation, the rise of the Protestant church, the emphasis on the individual, I think of John Stuart Mill and his essay on, on liberty in the 19th century and so on, all of these are, these are you can see kind of linkages uh, through history that have uh, created a, a, a link of chains, if you like, that, 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 that bind these things uh, together. Jules, how does this um, lead on to Britain tackling slavery? Uh, slavery? Um, I know there was, there was a religious um, influence there, the Quakers uh, who, who uh, abhorred uh, slavery. But this, um, just talk us through Britain's um, position on slavery in the in the nineteenth century. Yeah, well, just to preface that, I mean, it's it's an interesting interesting to note that uh, uh, in in Britain in England, um, slavery was outlawed as far back as the eleventh uh, or twelfth century. I, I can't remember the details off the top of my head, but that that was um, um, introduced into law. Mm -hmm. um, Interestingly enough, the, the, uh, the, the history of British resistance um, uh, to slavery and, and the, the um, moves to abolish uh, abolition worldwide uh, really um, emerged through the Quaker movement in the, uh, the 18th century. Again, another a, a, a Protestant denomination. Mm -hmm. And the, the Quakers abhorred uh, 
the notion of slavery wherever it might be practiced. And uh, uh, many of the uh, early um, abolitionists were, were Quakers who, who were agitating to, for, for Britain to uh, influence the international uh, uh, trade in, in slavery. Um, this culminated in 1833 in the Abolition of Slavery Act uh, in, in, in Britain. Uh, William Wilberforce was the, the key person behind that. But it's not as well known that there were several other acts much earlier in the 19th century which uh, dealt with and, and abolished aspects of slavery. And something like, uh, and again, <laughs> I, I, I'm just chewing stuff out of the top of my, my, my head from memory rather than having it all in front of me, but something like 50 or 60,000 British military personnel in the first half of the 19th century died uh, fighting um, slavery. Yeah. yeah, that's something uh, yeah. I don't think enough people uh, know about. Uh, Jules, well, it's also a, it, the fact that the, the Barbary pirates were very active on the, on, on the English coastline. Um, well, on the, on the European coastline generally, but I mean, Britain, no less. That's, uh, that, that's an interesting adjunct to it all if we're talking about slavery. But yes, I mean, the, there was a substantial white slave trade, um, which was all about the abduction of uh, white people from European shores, including British shores, uh, uh, associated with the um, pirates of the Barbary Coast. And these people were sold into uh, slavery um, in, in North Africa and the Barbary Coast. And of course, the Barbary Coast, we shouldn't forget, isn't just about the sort of North African Arab lands on the Mediterranean and, and uh, up to Morocco and so on. I mean, the Barbary Coast uh, stretched southwards all the way down towards the Bight of Africa. Um, so this wasn't an exclusively an Arab operation. Um, you know, it also involved black Africans who were part of the Barbary pirate, uh, if you like, empire. But these, these people would pitch up at lonely uh, you know, British uh, villages on, on the coast and literally, literally raid, raid those villages. Um, wipe out a few males and, 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 and take women and children and sell them into slavery. And it's estimated that the, the total trade in white slaves from Western Europe was something somewhere between one and two, two million uh, over that, that period. That's, a, that's uh, a slave trade the world knows very little about. Well, it's just um, conveniently not discussed. Mm. Jules, um, continuing on the slave trade, uh, Moffat, Robert Moffat, Livingston, um, early missionary explorers uh, were actually r at the vanguard of trying to deal with the problem on the ground. Is that not right? Yeah, I mean, I think let's, let's use Livingston because he's probably the, the, the best known example. And, and rather ironically, there are currently moves um, in Scotland to uh, uh, cancel Livingston, um, would you believe? Uh, simply because as a boy of 10, he, he, he worked in a cotton factory and the cotton was produced by slaves um, in, in North America. Uh, and, you know, this little boy of 10 years old is now being cancelled out of the history books because he had that sort of indirect connection and no responsibility at all. That's an aside. Uh, again, in Livingston, uh, going back to the early part of our discussion, you see the perfect marriage between Protestant religion and uh, colonialism and the anti-slavery movement. I mean, you couldn't think of a better example uh, to, to talk about. So Livingston went out uh, with the London Missionary Society uh, in 1840, I think it was, only seven years after the abolition of slavery act. So the, the whole idea of uh, the abolition of slavery internationally was, was very current uh, when Livingston went out to Africa. He initially went up to Kuruman, where Robert Moffat uh, was, was a uh, was the um, head of the, 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 the mission there, and he ended up actually marrying Robert Moffat's daughter, Mary. Um, but of course, Livingston famously then went on these great journeys of discovery and ex expeditions uh, in, in southern and central Africa. He's known as the discoverer of the Victoria Falls, which he named after the reigning British monarch at the time. Um, but in his travels, uh, uh, Livingston en en encountered um, indigenous native populations that had never, ever before themselves encountered white people. Uh, so this was a complete uh, uh, novelty, if you like, for, for both Livingston and his entourage and the, you know, the native tribes people 
who he encountered in these remote, um, these remote little settlements along the Zambezi River, the Shire River, up into Malawi, uh, and so forth. And uh, you know, I've read Livingston's uh, diaries, and it's quite interesting how um, he comments on his um, encounters with the reality of the slave trade, um, and particularly the East. Uh, east coast of Africa slave trade, which of course had been dominated for two or three thousand years, if not longer, by by Arab slave traders. That's why you have Arab settlements in places like Dar es Salaam and Zanzibar, and so on, and the the rise of uh, Mohammedism in more recent history um, uh, along along that that east coast. Uh, but what, of course, what Livingston observed was that the slaves that were being uh, taken off the east coast by the Arab slave traders didn't sort of somehow walk through thousand miles of, of bush and say, please take me away and capture me as a slave. Of course, uh, they were captured and enslaved by uh, black despots, by black chiefs or kings, whatever you want to call them, who, mm. who captured their own and, and sold them into slavery to the Arab, Arab slave traders. But of course, there was a, a flourishing slave trade within black Africa itself. Uh, so slaves weren't only sold to Arabs, they were also enslaved uh, within uh, by dominant tribes within particularly Central um, Africa, extending down towards uh, Zimbabwe. Interestingly enough, uh, Zimbabwe um, never became a center for um, slave trading with the, the East Coast. The, with the slavery that Livingston encountered there was, was much more internal. Uh, 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 but he comments on this and, and is enraged and outraged by it. And the other thing that's interesting when you read his original diaries is how. Um, how struck he was by the complete lack of any valuation placed upon human life uh, in, 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 in the, in the uh, if you like, the uncivilized tribal Africa that, that he encountered in those travels. And the one thing, that, the, the one account of his that I remember, um, having read those diaries several years ago, uh, was he, he, he went to a village, he, or he arrived at a village, where a, um, there was a dispute between two, two men about something or other, you know, some, some, something rel relatively trivial, like, you know, I, I don't know what it was, but it was very trivial. There were lots of little children playing around uh, the crawl, and the one fella just went up and absolutely, you know, uh, battered the other guy to death um, in front of the children. And what, what particularly struck Livingston was that the, the, the children sort of carried on playing as though nothing particularly interesting had happened. And this is what prompted him to make that observation about the, you know, the almost complete lack of value and concern for, for human life. So he, he saw, Livingston saw slavery in its, in its rawest terms. Uh, and of course, as a committed Christian missionary um, bent on ab abolishing slavery and, 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 if you like, bringing the benefits of civilization to, yeah. to, to pe people who had not existed or mm -hmm. developed up to a state of civilization were key drivers, key motivations. And um, this is the interesting thing. That this is where we come back to the idea of colonialism. Livingston's, Livingston's belief was that if Britain were to colonize uh, these areas in Africa that lent themselves to, if you like, European occupation because of um, you know, advantageous climates and so on, um, that this would bring the benefits of civilization to uncivilized um, peoples, peoples who had not got modern medicine, education, communications, and so on. This was Livingston's idea, and Livingston had a huge influence on British politics. He went back to Britain and advocated uh, that there should be you know, a systematic um, colonization uh, of these areas for two reasons. First of all, to bring those positive benefits, if you like, to peoples who had, had not had the good fortune, if you like, as Western peoples had had in Western European culture, to bring them the benefits of all, all that development and advancement on the one hand, but also on the other, and Livingston was unashamed in, in saying that, you know, this is also a commercial opportunity. There are natural resources here that can be exploited. And if you want to have a healthy, if you like, uh, colonization, then, then, you know, there has to be a, a healthy sort of commercial element to it as well. So Liz Livingston was massively 
influential in 19th century colonization, particularly of Africa. I suppose looking back, Jules uh, Rhodes's mistake was he was he was he got rich, but but he also believed, like Livingston, that mm. British rule would be a positive and it would be beneficial exactly. to the individuals. I mean, yeah, I mean Rhodes's uh, philosophy, uh, which you just out outlined, was quite simply a, a, an iteration of the principles that Livingston himself had advocated to the British government and to Queen Victoria, no less. Um, yes, I mean, R Rhodes was not some, uh, suddenly some sort of evil uh, financial genius who, who came out of nowhere. Rhodes was part of a continuum, an historical continuum, um, which was, uh, you know, embedded in, in, in the, the British poli body politic of the time. Uh, and uh, he, he, he wrote as merely an extension of that general thought pattern uh, which prevailed. Uh, I mean, it's, it's fashionable nowadays to, to portray uh, colonialism as an evil, as a crime against humanity. Uh, well, frankly, to my response, that is an, an absolute load of rubbish, yeah, particularly when you, you, you consider the, uh, the British model, which was by and large fairly benevolent. Mm. Uh, I mean, if you, can, if you look at the, the Belgian model of colonialism, that's a different matter altogether. I mean, that was horrific, and uh, nobody could possibly defend that. And I'm not saying that British colonialism didn't have its downside or its bad side, but generally speaking, it was a benevolent force, um, and certainly in the African context. Yeah, in um, Duncan Clark's book, it's quite interesting. He actually um, repeats what you just said, about the fact that uh, slavery was widespread in Zimbabwe, or what was then mm. um, that area between the Pope and the Zambezi, and it was internal, and it was really yeah. effectively wiped out by Rhodes. But again, um, Rhodes gets very little credit for that. Yeah, no, that that, that is that is right, and uh, yeah, uh, the <laughs> I mean, the interesting thing is that if you if you look at Let's talk about Rhodesia, Zimbabwe, uh, what, Zambezi, or whatever you want to call it, um, and perhaps Southern Africa more, more generally. I mean, the interesting thing for me is that the, the colonization of Zimbabwe uh, was the, the, the policy with regard to the, uh, the, the native black population was pretty enlightened. I mean, the British government. Uh, you know, going right back to the early days of the occupation of Mashonaland and so on, we're especially concerned that the, the interests and the rights of the, the black population should be protected under any political systems that evolved and developed. And this extended to the, um, when uh, Southern Rhodesia was given the um, right to self-governance in 1923, uh, the constitution contained all sorts of checks and balances that were designed primarily to protect the interests of, of of the the the, the, uh, the you know the black native population, um, and um, you know the successive Rhodesian governments themselves um, were kind of pretty determined to try and develop uh, the, the you know, black people of of Zimbabwe, Rhodesia, uh, and to provide them with opportunities to develop more sophisticated agriculture, to access education, and so on. Mm. And in 1953, for example. Uh, the United Nations published a report on the state of education in Africa in which it highlighted southern Rhodesia as being the best example in the entire continent of Africa uh, for the education of indigenous, its indigenous native population. Uh, I've, I've got a copy of that report, so I've read it, so I know what I'm talking about on that. Um, and, you know, it's quite remarkable to think that the United Nations uh, in 1953 was... Uh, you know, highlighting Southern Rhodesia as an example of absolute excellence, and actually, in fact, I mean, on a personal note, it was my um, my maternal grandfather who was the then uh, permanent secretary of education in the Federation of Rhodesia and Nyasaland, and therefore a lot of the credit for for that policy must ultimately go go to him. But the point I'm making is that we we nurtured our populations, we we we, we were concerned for them, we were interested in them, we. We wanted them to improve. Now, I mean, some people will uh, criticize that and say, well, it was rather condescending and paternalistic. And perhaps 
you know, had elements of that. But you can't, you can't m match up a sophisticated uh, civilization and culture with an unsophisticated one and expect the two to have absolutely no differences. That's stupid. But here's the interesting thing. We nurtured our populations. In 1890, when the pioneer column occupied Mashonaland. land, it's estimated the entire population of the whole of what is now Zimbabwe amounted to no more than sort of, you know, three to 500,000 souls. That's an estimate because nobody could possibly uh, mm. would have counted them. But, the, the, you know, it's, it's, um, let's say around about 400,000 people. You think of 400,000 people living in that vast area uh, and you get some idea that, you know, the, the land was hardly bubbling over with population. 2015, 2016, the Zimbabwe population is estimated to have topped somewhere around 17 million. Okay, so that's what the benefits of medicine and education and all the rest of it um, uh, resulted in. Now, you contrast that. Uh, and that's the, that's the reason why, if you like, the, you know, the whole Rhodesian experiment failed because, you know, the, 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 uh, the, the native, the indigenous population burgeoned uh, under those under those benefits and, and, and grew exponentially as a population. You contrast that with the colonies, the British colonies that were uh, developed um, or established in uh, what's now United States of America, Canada, Australia and New Zealand, where they decimated uh, their indigenous populations um, to the extent that they became so um, so subdued and so mm -hmm. small and tiny in number mm -hmm. that they could never possibly represent any kind of population threat to the, the colonizers. And those four countries are arguably the most successful colonies ever. Uh, in Australia, uh, the state governments in the 19th, and, uh, I think early 20th century, offered bounty payments to people who could come, would come in with them pairs of ears to prove that they'd exterminated uh, the uh, uh, indigenous Aboriginal people mm -hmm. uh, who were considered by state governments of the day as vermin. Now, that's completely, that kind of policy is 100% alien to anything that we ever did or valued in Rhodesia. That just simply would not have happened. Mm -hmm. um, but we were a failed colony. They are not. And we the villains. Well, we're the scapegoats, aren't we? It's as simple as that. It's easy, e easy to easy to do that when, when uh, you know, your Red Indian population or your Aboriginal population is uh, so tiny that they represent no, uh, no threat to you. Jules, I want to... Uh change tax slightly uh, the rise i want to talk to you about the rise of black nationalism um mm -hmm. which eventually became a very powerful factor and um yeah. impacted in a big way on our lives but its origins again are really in europe uh with the bolsheviks is that not right um the Bolshevik? yeah i mean i think again i'm not an expert in this i mean I, i'm conjecturing but hopefully with a a, a flicker of intelligence informing that conjecture. Uh, again, I think the, the rise of black nationalism um, represents in many ways a marriage between Marxist thinking and Christian influence uh, and, and the, 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 the bringing together of those two streams of thought into, into, a, political, uh, into a political philosophy. Um, the the, the uh, creation of the uh, Union of Soviet Socialist Republics by Lenin uh, following the Russian Revolution of 1917 was a, a massive um, factor in uh, trumpeting to the world that there was a new kind of socialist uh, uh, pathway uh, to deal with uh, oppressors. And look, we've overthrown the oppressors. I mean, I'm not going getting into this now, but as an aside, uh, anybody who wishes to get a grasp of history and particularly the history of, of, of terrorism, both state terrorism and, if you like, uh, uh, nationalist movement terrorism, should read a, <clears throat> an authoritative biography of Lenin, because Lenin uh, based his whole uh, political philosophy and um, uh, um, political kind of management system on the application of terror. But that's an aside. Um, so I think what you see is that you, you start to see uh, the early um, rise of black nationalism through things like trade union movements, I mean, Joshua and Coma was a uh, key man in the trade union in the, in the Zimbabwe context, for example, and that 
combined with the, um, uh, if you like, the influence of, of the church and particularly mission churches in uh, pushing uh, for, if you like, black liberation and black emancipation, or whatever you want to call it. Uh, uh, that was that was you know a significant kind of breeding ground in the aftermath of the Russian Revolution and and so on. But really, where we see uh, things beginning to take a much bigger kind of evolution is in the aftermath of World War Two, um, and the 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 you know the the, the rise of America to in global dominance as a consequence of its involvement in World War Two. And and I mean the Americans demanded. Um, and orchestrated the demise of the British Empire uh, for two reasons. First of all, the Americans thought they were the greatest democracy on earth. Well, it was okay. That was easy enough for them because they kind of wiped out, the, or pretty well wiped out, the, the native um, Indian population, Native American population. Uh, but also, I mean, they, they were hard nosed businessmen and wanted to get their hands on uh, the commercial opportunities uh, that existed in the British Empire. So, you know, the uh, it all started with the uh, independence of India and its partition, and then, of course, the uh, Macmillan's winds of change uh, in the early 60s. Well, that, yeah, so, that sharp left turn after World War II with, with mm, Anthony, um, yeah, uh, yeah, also a factor, the rise of the trade, as you say, the trade unions and the rise of socialism, which uh, did impact political thought in, 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 in Britain. Um, yeah, but the missionaries carried on. I mean, they, they remained very committed, very involved. And um, I mean, a chap like Robert Mugabe is really a product of the, um, of, 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 of the mission um, you know, campaign in, in, in Rhodesia. He, he, he was... Yeah, yeah he there. was uh, <clears throat> Robert, Robert uh, comrade, Robert Gabriel Mugabe was a mission schoolboy. Uh, uh, there's a, a Kutama mission, the Catholic, the Catholic mission. I mean, you think of someone like Garfield Todd, who was a who, who was one of the um, prime ministers of, of Rhodesia, was himself a missionary, uh, and you know, quite a, quite a radical fellow, and very much uh, associated himself after his premiership with the development of black nationalism uh, and liberation and so on. Um, I mean, one, one sort of parallel force, which is worth just touching on briefly, is the, the rise of postmodernism uh, and, and cultural uh, critical theory. Now, this, this, this arose uh, in, in German universities uh, amongst intellectuals. Um, and critical theory really is now manifest in, in, if you like, the work world of today. That's, that, that's where that all comes from. And these were uh, German academics working in the, the 1930s in, in German universities, who many of whom fled <clears throat> and were offered um, uh, asylum, if you like, in, in the, particularly in the United States, uh, where they entered the university, the academe there, and developed these, these ideas of postmodernism. And um, <clears throat> of course, that's, that then kind of translated into what we call today cultural Marxism. And the long march following World War II, the long march through the institutions of cultural Marxism. Now, with the, the fall of the Berlin Wall uh, and, and the whole kind of Eastern European and Russian communist system in 1990, um, Marxism lost its essential focus, which was, you know, workers of the world. Um, it, it, that hadn't worked. You know, the, the, the workers hadn't risen up. Total revolution hadn't occurred. People were more interested in beer and cigarettes and sex. And uh, so, you know, the workers of the world unite, all that sort of failed. Uh, but the, the, those who are the fundamental Marxist philosophers who were absolutely addicted to the idea of, of total revolution and the oppressors throwing off the oppressed, very, very skillfully turned their attention to the cultural arena. And that's been far more successful. And the long march through the uh, institutions of cultural Marxism uh, first sort of accelerated in the 1950s, blossomed uh, in the 1960s, um, came of age in the 1970s, uh, started filtering into every corner of the uh, academic system in the Western world in, in the 1980s and 90s, um, sort of came of age in the 2000s and then exploded into action uh, you know, around about 2014, 2015, and that's what we're living with today. And um, so all of these kind of currents, 
if you like, uh, have sort of come together in the past few years. Jules, um, where do we find ourselves today? From what I can see, um, in many ways, I'm sorry to say, Africa has gone some way back to where we found it um, a few hundred years ago, and that um, lawlessness is growing. Uh, slavery is certainly rampant in many parts of, of Africa. Um, um, populations growing rapidly despite everything. Um, yeah. Poor governance, and um, Africa is not, not in a good place today. I, I'm sorry to say. Yeah. Um... I mean, I mean, Africa is probably the only continent in the world uh, which has regressed in terms of its uh, economy, in terms of its social development, uh, you know, in terms of every measure. Excuse me. Come on, get out of there. Oh. Love you, dog. Sorry. Uh, you know, so by every measure, uh, I mean, Africa has regressed uh, from, from its uh, pre-independence status. Uh, the only thing where it has moved forward is that it's liberated. Um, but it's, I mean, what, what basically what Africa has done is it has reverted to the, uh, the, um, the, the organization and philosophy of the strong man. So I, I'm, I'm the chief, you do what I say, if you don't do that, then you get killed. Uh, it's a, it's, it's know, a very, um, weird. That's, 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 the, that's the system. Jules, where it's um, pertinent to Western Europe certainly is the growing pressure on the borders of the UK and Europe um, from African migrants. And this problem is not going to go away anytime soon from what I can see. Um, no, I think that I think I think that's that, that's a fair point. I mean the the thing to consider perhaps um, is that uh, the uh, the population of sub-Saharan Africa is the fastest growing population in the world with the highest birth and fertility rates. Um, and, that, and that's where the pressure is coming from. I mean, the, you, know, the, you couple that, you know, hugely burgeoning uh, population with uh, uh, lack of economic opportunity, jobs, uh, and perhaps pressure on water resources and things like that. I mean, it's just, just it's inevitable that, uh, you know, you, you, you're going to get that population seeking and exploiting opportunities particularly in, in in western europe which is still wealthy and which is you know in is the closest um geographical area uh, to travel to uh, and also um is in the same time zone basically you don't have to cross the pacific ocean or the atlantic ocean to get there you just have to hop across uh, the Straits of Gibraltar or take a slightly longer trip uh, through the Middle East and then back in. So, yes, I, I think there's going to be a, an, I mean, in the next century, you know, long after we've gone, there's going to be absolutely massive um, pressure. And it's understandable. I mean, if you were, if you were a downtrodden you know, a black person in, in one of those you know, dreadful Af African countries where, where you had, uh, you daily faced uh, brutality and violence and there was no job and, um, well, if I was in their shoes, I'd do exactly that, wouldn't you? There's a huge irony here, though, um, which actually I think gives the lie to this whole allegation about colonialism being a crime against humanity. If it was such, why is it that all these people are actually seeking sanctuary uh, under the flags of the former colonial powers? If they were so beastly, why do Africans want to, I mean, they're risking their lives daily to get back under their governance. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 it is a huge irony, but then we, we live in a world where, where truth is no longer a commodity that forms part of the political body politic, the body politic. I mean, uh, I'm not getting into all of the kind of other stupid things that are going on, but, mm -hmm. you know, when, when um, yeah, we, we tell lies about gender and stuff and you know that those are accepted as as truths i mean it, there is no longer a a uh, not even a veneer of truth that informs uh, you know, political thinking it's it's and and yeah so uh, it doesn't surprise me that people um can sort of say that colonialism is a crime against humanity on the one hand and then seek to go and get the benefits of the colonial mother 
It's just part of the way the world is. One last question. I just want to toss out Mm. there. What do you, how do you see the the British plan to um, to use Rwanda as a (laughs) processing facility um, unfolding? Yes, I mean, as, as you probably are aware, I mean, there's been an enormous hoo-ha about that here with, with you know, uh, people uh, making all sorts of claims about the awful nature of Boris and Pretty Patel, who, who is a um, as you know, Indian background, and I, you know, I think she seems to be a very nice person. But, for, but so there's been an enormous hoo-ha. Um, the, the thing that intrigued me about it is why did the British government choose, choose Rwanda? Because it was never a British colony. No. Uh, um, and the only thing I can imagine is that it suited them not to have a former British colony as a member of the British Commonwealth that could create a whole lot of cuck and hassle in the, in the, <laughs> in the, in, in the sort of Commonwealth organisation uh, if one of their number um, had, had signed up to this. Um, look, I mean, Britain's got a massive... Um, migration problem, illegal migration problem. And I mean, so so far that I, as far as I can see, successive governments have done very little, if anything, to, to deal with that. Um, whether or not this plan will, will work, if it ever gets and if it ever gets um, any legs, uh, remains to be seen. I mean it's not altogether different in principle from what the Australians did to stop the, the boat people mm. uh, drowning themselves in thousands on the way to uh, uh, illegal entry into Australia. And that seems to have been pretty effective. Um, the, the, the globalists will, will, will say na- nation states are evil. They're horrible. We should have no borders. And this is why Europe has been borderless, because the postmodernist politicians who've been running Europe, particularly Merkel and, as a good example, uh, have have abhorred uh, national boundaries, but uh, if you if you if I say to you, Hannes, you 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 have a nice garden uh, 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 surrounding your house, and surrounding the garden along its perimeter is a fence or a hedge. Um, how would you feel, or would you be willing to um, destroy those fences and hedges, and just say to the world outside, "Come and enjoy my garden." You can have barbecues in there. You can lie around on the lawns, throw your rubbish here, and then do whatever you want to. It's, you know, it's open. You wouldn't do that, would you? And I suspect uh, you know, 99.999% of the highly wealthy chattering classes is, uh, classes is around themselves with high fences and hedges around their vast gardens in the south of England. Uh, similarly, would have a total sense of human failure if someone tore down the hedges and said well we're coming to park ourselves us national governments should be there to you know, protect the borders to protect their populations from invasion of whatever kind it is whether it's p- peaceful invasion of illegal I- immigration or something like what putin is doing in, in ukraine the national governments exist to protect their uh, the people who voted them into power and uh, not to just open sesame the entire country to anybody who wants to come in without check or balance so you know, they've got to do something. Um, is it too little, too late? And how effective will it be? And will will the political elite here, uh, you know, the woke political elite, uh, permit them to actually ever to implement that? I don't know. Well, at risk of um, throwing a spanner in the, in the works of what's been a pretty moderate discussion, I would suggest that if the British came back to Africa, and stuck a Union Jack in the ground somewhere and said, okay, this piece of land belongs to us and we're going to run it. Um, That would go a long way to solving the problem because a lot of Africans would rush to be back under the Union flag. Um, But that's that's, that's a reality. I don't think anybody actually wants to get their heads around. No, well, I mean, I've, uh, yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure in, in principle you're right, but in, from a practical point of view, political point of view, so go, I read a fascinating paper, and I can't remember who the author was, but it was a serious, serious paper, but basically saying just that, but in a, with a slightly different uh, perspective. And what he was saying was that, you know, if Africa wants to rescue itself from itself, you know, what it, an, an enlightened policy would be to ask former colonial powers like Britain to set up commercial enclaves, mm. uh, which would be given special status, tax mm. status, mm. and so forth, and would give um, solid protection to any, uh, if you like, British or whichever 
um, ethnic groups mm. came along to take advantage of those commercial enclaves. And those would be engines of economic development, social development, political development, and so on, which would not undermine, if you like, the liberated status of Africa, but which actually introduce uh, some stability and economic uh, uh, prosperity, and therefore hope for the future, where none currently exists. I mean, you only have to look at Zimbabwe well, you know, to see an way. example of... of a country which have been destroyed. You know, um, in, a, in a slightly nuanced way, I see it living here in the Western Cape. This, is, this province is the last responsibly administered province in South Africa and probably mm. in Africa, um, thanks to the Democratic Alliance, which happens to have a white leader. But um, there's obviously there, there are many blacks and coloreds involved in the, in the DA. But, it is the last decent administration. And as a result, uh, I don't know what's going to happen to the Western Cape because the influx of people from South Africa and the, the whole of Africa is um, becoming so onerous. I don't know where all these people, and we're seeing it on a daily basis here with the growth of these shanty towns. And this mm. is all about um, Africans looking for decent governance. And the yeah. last semblance sure. of it is here in, in the Western Cape. And I feel sorry for the DA uh, because I think they're going to be victims of their own success in a way. They mm -hmm. just don't, uh, they can't produce the infrastructure to, to cope with the numbers. Yeah. Well, how does, I mean, that's an interesting, you know, that's an interesting perspective. And, and in, in a way, I mean, the, you know, the Western Cape is a microcosm of the dynamic of what's affecting Western Europe. Mm -hmm. You know, people are desperate to leave these terrible conditions. I mean, the, the Zimbabwe diaspora is counted in the millions. These are millions of people, not the white population, black people who've fled Zimbabwe and, and settled and found work and security and stability, you know, thousands of miles away from that country in Southern Africa because it's been destroyed. And there is no stability. There's nothing there for them. And so what, you know, the, this... This um, overwhelming of the Western Cape by migration, from, by desperate people seeking work, stability, economic prosperity, and so on, is just a microcosm of what's happening uh, with the northward migration across the Mediterranean. It's as simple as that. Jules, I'm sorry we find ourselves in this sorry situation today, but um, I think we, to be fair to ourselves, we did, we both did try in a, in a little way to. Uh, to make life better for our fellow Africans and make yeah. our country a better place. But uh, we were horribly outnumbered. And we, in a sense, I suppose we lost. And that's why we are where we are today. But uh, I'm terribly grateful to you for your insight into what has happened, what's behind the situation that we find ourselves in today. And I just hope that a lot of the younger generation listen into what you've had to say, because I feel for them. Um, these, the younger people who are being brought up believing that they're guilty of some sort of a monstrous crime. But it's a terrible way to develop and, and live your life believing that you've, that you've done something wrong when you haven't actually done something wrong. Yeah. Um, so if we can have a little bit of an impact on that problem, I, I feel we, we would have achieved something. Yeah. Um, I suppose my, my, my thought is that you know, that <clears throat> life is about big circles, isn't it? Everything, you know, it's that circularity of life. The, you know, things mm -hmm. come back, come around again. And I, I think that the current madness that's infected the, the Western world, whenever it might be, uh, the people of future generations that don't even exist now, it will, will take a fresh look at all of that. I've got no doubt about that. The, uh, the thing for you and I is that we have our own children who you know, are part of this awful dynamic. And, um, you know, one feels for them. I certainly but, do. Uh, what worries me in you know, the African context is the damage that has been done at such speed. By yes. the time anybody wakes up to trying to sort some of these problems out, I don't know what's going to be left. Um, and this is where I lose all time for the so-called environmentalists and the global warmists and um, all these fear-mongering um, organizations 
nobody seems to pay much attention to the ecological damage being done in Africa um, because it's Africa. And there's a very little attempt being made to find solutions and take remedial action. But that's another that's another discussion for another day. We, we can have that one. <laughs> but thanks, Jules. I know you've got to get on with your day, and I've got, sure. to, I've got it too. So thanks very much for your time. Well, thank you for inviting me, Hannes. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Cheers, my boy.